as the offering is being passed, if you want to open your Bibles, I hopefully you are reading in the Daily Bible and uh, staying with us as a church. We go through the Daily Bible and then on Sundays teach from those uh, scriptures of what you've been reading. And this, today, we're going to be on what page, Raquel? 64. Page 64, actually, which is Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, which is, again, page 64 of the Daily Bible. This is what you read this past week. We're going to be talking uh, the discussion of fear and how when we get into fear, we get overcome and the world swallows us up. I read a quick uh, little story about fear. Johnny was being put to bed one night. His mother was putting him to bed, and it was a thunderstorm. And he was afraid, you know, thunder and lightning. And he whispered to his mom, he says, Mommy, won't you, won't you stay tonight in my bed? And Mommy said, Johnny, I, I've got to go stay with Daddy. There was a little moment of silence, and Johnny said, The big sissy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hopefully you find, found this, Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 14. And I'm going to ask Raquel to read. Immediately, Jesus, verse 22, Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and, began, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. All right, let's go back and, and look at these verses and pick them apart just a little bit. I'm just going to go over again and start reading and discussing a few of these things, beginning in the 22nd verse again. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Doesn't it seem like every time there's ever a boat mentioned in the Bible, the waves and the wind are always against it? Does it, does it seem like that to anybody but me? I think it's because it is that way because, again, this is all supposed to be a picture of life. And just in case you haven't lived on this planet for very long, generally, the wind is going to be against you. Anybody figured that out yet? You probably didn't even need to come to church to figure that out, that the wind is against you. But we, what we do come to church for is to get the answers to these things. All right, the wind was against it. Verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. I mean, a hundred times out of a hundred, that's God's message to us, take courage, don't be afraid. Um, they were obviously fearful. Let me just stop and make a quick comment. I realize that there's a certain percentage of uh, people that struggle just even believing uh, that Jesus walked on water. I mean, how can you really believe that? He walked on water. It's impossible to walk on water. Well, if God has revealed himself to us and we've received Christ, and that's a product of revelation, God reveals himself to us, and if God's revealed himself to you, uh, then you probably have the faith that God created this universe, and if you believe that God can create this universe and all of the, you know, the dynamics of this universe, I don't think it should be that big of a stretch if God can create this universe that he could cause somebody to you know, upturn the laws of physics and walk on water. Who believes God can do that? Now, I, you know, I, think, I don't think the message here is for us to learn, you know, three quick and easy steps of how to walk on water, all right? Don't worry. I think when you, you need to take a bath tonight, you'll probably slip right in. Don't worry, all right? But uh, again, absolutely, uh, I believe that. Why? Because, again, God has revealed himself to me as uh, my Savior, the Creator, and, hey, I believe him, and he's proved himself to me a thousand times. So, yes, we believe this, but I think the lessons we're to get on out of this is, is how we can walk on the circumstances of life because we're going to be called to walk in some very difficult circumstances. Some of us in this room 
I mean, we're all in different spots, but some of us in this room are called to walk in places that you're tempted to feel is impossible, that what's out in front of you is impossible. It's a very dark situation. It's an impossible situation. To you, it's tantamount to walking on water. It's impossible. Well, if we follow his advice, I think we can do it. All right, they're terrified. They cry out in fear. Jesus says to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. That's always God's word to you, no matter what the situation is. No matter how fearful you might be tempted to be, God's word to us is always, don't be afraid. Fear is never your friend. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Now notice that, one word, just one word, but Peter is stepping out because the Lord has told him to come. And in in that simplicity, there's many things that God is going to tell us to do. There's many things God tells us to do in his word, uh, in our own personal lives. There's going to be some directions that God gives us. And when God gives you personal directions, how many found out that when you're following what God has told you to do, that he'll uphold you no matter what comes your way? Has anybody discovered that besides me? He'll uphold you. Even, you know, sometimes he tells you to, to walk out in some circumstances that are difficult. And as you look around, it seems maybe potentially impossible. But if you're doing what the Lord has told you to do, he is going to uphold you, and that is imperative, that we remember that, that if he told me to do it, I mean, it's really simple. I'm doing the last thing God told me to do. The last real clear set of directions I got from the God was to marry this girl. We're still, we're still married, right? Last right? time I checked. Last time I checked, all right. Marry this girl. I, told, I remember him telling me to come to Maine, start a church, pastor a church. Years ago, he told me to work with this bald guy in the front row. He wasn't bald back then. <laughs> And, uh, you know, obviously there's some smaller, you know, directions he's given along the way. But what's my point? Uh, there's been a lot of difficult things along the way, but I know I'm doing what he told me to do. I know what I'm doing the last, you know, real big, clear set of directions he gave me. So I have watched him enable us to walk on the water, to overcome any number of different natural circumstances, you know, very negative things. And, uh, you know, just like Peter, if I would have, you know, gotten paid too much attention to them, that fear would have probably kept me from doing what God tells me, told me to do. But we need to. We need to be able to step out of the boat and do what God tells us to do. And I know Raquel has a little story that would illustrate some of that for us. Well, when we lived um, in Oklahoma, we lived there for six years. We were youth pastoring um, and children's pastoring there. And it was a very comfortable place to be. Everything was taken care of. My parents were there. We had fa- family and friends were around us. And it was a very comfortable place to be And when God told us, to go to Maine to start a church. We had never been to Maine. We, you know, it wasn't till you know shortly before we moved here that I even knew New England was in America, <laughs> in the same boat of a lot of other people in the other part of the world, America. So, you know, coming to Maine, you know, was was huge. It wasn't a small thing. I mean, these were huge waves we that were coming against us to come here. You know, we didn't have very much money, but God said, "Go to Maine and start a church." And we had a, a three-year-old, and at the time when we left, we had a five-month-old baby. You know, you know, it's not a very comfortable position to be in to be told to move across country where you don't know anybody, you don't have a job, and you don't have a place to live. And sending Brian ahead of us to go find these things out wasn't an option for us financially at the time. We just had to take the leap of faith in our U-Haul and drive across the country. You know, it wasn't easy. There was a lot of waves, and we had a new baby. I had to leave my parents. I had to um, come here without a job, without a place to live. You know, before we moved here, we did kind of look into it, and we found that there was nothing available to live in. That's what we found out. And uh, so when we got here, you know, we had to find a place, which was not easy, but, you know, go ahead. And as you... And before you came, and this is just the true, this is true of, of every situation you're going to live in in life, uh, there's always going to be people who feel like it's their job uh, to warn you of how bad it is out there. This, they, really, they, they, I think they honestly believe they're doing you a favor to warn you of how hard it is, to warn you about the, uh, the Mainer. There's, there, did you know that the, that, that the phrase Mainer lives in legend outside? It really does. There's... <laughs> There's a lot of stories told out there of what a true Mainer is like, and we were told that they would actually eat us, is what we were told. We were told this was the graveyard for ministers, Maine. Uh, but again, just the point, that, that it's not just, yeah, there were some, 
you know, natural waves that, that are, were real, that if you didn't have the word of the Lord, it would have been wise to, to take heed to that. I mean, I said a second ago, fear is never your friend. That's really not completely accurate. I mean, there is a certain mechanism that God has set up in us that, that, is, you know, that fears to warn us. I mean, if you step out on the road and you see a truck coming, it'd probably be a good thing to pay heed to that fear and go ahead and get out of the road. You understand? I mean, in that sense, it is a natural thing uh, that is going to happen, you know, that, that fear, and you should take heed to it. But the, the difference is here is you have the word of God telling you to do something, and now we need to step out in what God has told us to do, and that's when we need to ignore some of these fears and these reports that will come to you. So that's what we did. We moved to Maine against all of uh, everybody's we knew's better judgment, and we came here. And, you know, God provided, and God, yes, there was moments of, you know, there was some fear involved. There was some at least temptation to be fe fearful coming here. You know, when we pulled into town, it was uh, midnight, and it didn't look very friendly, and... Um, you know, it was, it was a long road here, but when we got here, God provided. And even though there were many things that, many waves seemingly that would come against us that would hinder it or prevent us from coming, but we were, able, God was faithful and we were able to get here and make it and start a church and, and God has blessed us. And we feel totally overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly blessed to be here um, today. So thank God he told us to go. Amen. And again, the answer is to, to step out on faith with what God has told you to do. But you notice in these verses, if you'll, again, hopefully you'll keep your Bible open there to those uh, verses. I'm going to keep back, uh, referring back to them. Um, verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come. I mean, just one word. I mean, Peter's, Peter's on his way. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water. And came toward Jesus. I mean, he's actually doing it. He's actually walking on the water. And again, I say to you that many of us are in situations that might seem similar. Or you're looking out into your future, realizing that in order to, for my marriage to make it, in order for us to make it financially, uh, it seems about that impossible, Pastor Brian. I mean, things are stacked against us, and I need some help. Well, uh, God has the ability to enable you to walk on water, okay? So just stick with him. But it's important that you have his word. Without, without his word, you're not going to walk on water, all right? But let's see what happens here. So he's actually walking on the water. I mean, this should be a pretty amazing thing. I'm sure Peter realizes, wow, this is cool. I mean, you know, I've uh, jumped in the lake many times. He was a fisherman, and I've never done this before. This is amazing. So he's, he's, he's accomplishing the impossible, all right? He's walking on the water. Verse 30, but, that's a big but there. But when he saw the wind, the waves, when he saw this, you know, this wind that was against them, and obviously it's bringing up waves and white caps. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. Let me just stop right there and say fear is not challenging to figure out. There's nothing mysterious about fear. Fear is 100% of the time the natural, normal result of paying attention to the natural world around you. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. It, it's never been possible to pay attention to everything happening in the world around you and live without fear. You can't do it. It's never been done, never will be done, because the world has always, the wind has always been whipping. I know, you know, with the economy way it is, you hear a lot of reports about that, and some people make it sound like, whoa, it's, it's hard today. Friends, I've been, I'm 43. Am I 43 or 42? 43. 43. 43. Neither of us know how old I am. Anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> In my 43 years, I don't ever remember a time when I wasn't hearing people say and talk about how hard it is. It's always hard. The wind has always been against us. If you've ever read anything in history, I've read a lot of different history, but Raquel just finished reading The Little House on the, on the Prairie <laughs> books to the, the kids, and the rest of the family is slowly sort of creeping in there at bedtime and listening to the stories. Um, but you read those stories, and that wasn't that long ago. That was only in the 18, late 1800s. And, and for them, just surviving was a miracle. I mean, it's, what, zero degrees out there, and we're talking, you know, when we talk about hardship, we talk about a completely different thing. For them, just surviving the winter was a miracle in itself. They'd have to dig a tunnel from the house to the barn. they get so much snow, and it was just, I mean, just survival was a miracle. So what's, what's my point? In our mind, in our minds, there's, the, there's been this other place, this other time, this other world where everything was easy 
every, every other time except for the time we live in, every other place but the place we live, every other, you know, culture, every other time in history has been kind of like leave it to beaver. <laughs> you know, just June and Ward and the Beave and Wally. <laughs> Everything's great. I mean, your biggest trouble was using dad's razor, you know, something, some big problem. I, that was the only leave it to beaver episode I could remember. Um, <laughs> But the fact is, it's not that way. This world has always been, and if we'll just pay attention and be honest, the world has always been this way. And anybody who pays attention, and that's what the majority of the world does, so the majority of the world lives in fear because they feel like that's their job, to take in all the information of every wave and analyze every wind and analyze every wave, and they feel like, well, that's how I'm going to overcome. I've got to stay educated. I've got to stay on top of things. I'm not suggesting that we're supposed to crawl in a hole and be ignorant, but if you're going to pay attention to every wind and every wave, there's never been a time in history when you would not live in fear because there's fearful reports of gloom and doom surrounding you for the history of mankind. There have been, his, there have been reports of how hard it is, and a, a fair percentage of the people in this world, again, feel like it's their job to communicate to you just how hard it is and just what can't be done. We need to have faith. And really, the only real faith is going to come from God's Word. Does God have anything different to say in His Word? Does God have any promises concerning His people? Has God, does He have a proven track record of sustaining people in hard times? Again, friends, if you just read this and just go back to the, the stories in the Old Testament, realizing those were thousands of years ago, you know, sometimes we kind of just transpose our life onto them and think, you know, yeah, you know, it's just the same. Friends, again, just survival. Solomon, the richest man in the world, didn't even have running water. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure of this, but I don't think he had cable. <laughs> wow, that's tough. That's tough. He's toughing it. <laughs> What's the point? I mean, the, the, you know, for years and thousands of years, it, it has been tough. And people who want to pay attention to all the negative reports live in fear. And that's not how we're going to overcome. We're going to overcome by paying attention to what the Lord has to say. Uh, here's a, a scripture in the New Testament. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus. The synagogue ruler, Jesus, is on his way to heal this girl. And, and they bring Jairus this report. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Now, who knows? That's a pretty big wave. That's like, whoa, that, that is a big wave. That's the time to go tilt, melt. It's over. Verse 36, ignore, everybody say ignoring. ignoring. Ignoring what they said. Did Jesus have the nerve to ignore some reports? What, what, what did he do with this report? What did he do with it? How did Jesus process this, this vital update? How did Jesus process that vital update? He ignored it. Everybody say ignore Friends, we better figure this out. I mean, God has wired us. I don't know if you've ever, you know, even in, I think even in high school biology, they'll teach you a little bit about this, but the way our brain is wired, your brain receives billions of tidbits of information through your eyes and through your ears. And is the most, one of the most amazing things about our brain, the way God has wired it, is not what it can figure out and learn, but what it ignores. That it inherently knows what to ignore. If you processed every piece of information that came through your eyes and your ears, you would be an absolute basket case, completely and totally unable to function. But no, our brain has this uncanny, amazing ability to focus on what's important, to focus on what pertains to you, to focus on what is in front on your path that is important to you. And our brain has this ability. Most of the information is just background noise to us, and we ignore it. This is something that naturally our brain does. We better learn to do this concerning the reports because there's a lot of negative reports that are going to come to us. You know, just like in this report, only bigger, or, or this report may be a little bit bigger than the ones we are going to get. But you better learn to do this. Ignore what they said. This is still God's word to us. Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Does God ever have a different command to us? It seems like that, almost sometimes you read the Bible, it seems like that's just a broken record. Don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. But, 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 but there's this huge wave. Don't be afraid, just believe. Friends, it's only one possible way you're going to be in this situation and not be afraid and just believe. 
And that's you're going to have to keep your eyes on Christ. You're going to have to keep your eyes on his word. You're going to have to, the word of God is going to have to be a little bit more uh, important to you. What God has to say is going to have to be a little bit bigger in your heart and in your mind than the negative reports. And you're going to have to pay attention to what God has to say. Proverbs says this, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. The path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. That's us, right? Anybody with me? Six of you on this path. How about the rest of you? Your path is growing darker and darker till she all falls apart. No, the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter till the full light of day. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. Again, you pay attention to what the world's saying. That's, what, that's where you're headed. They do not know what makes them stumble. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. There's a reason why we ask you here to every day pull out the daily Bible and read it. And it's not so you can get a check mark, you know, for the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah done. Did it. No, it's to pay attention because you're going to get a different report here. You're going to get a different prognosis of your future here. And if you don't, but it's one thing to believe it. I mean, it's one thing to read it, rather. It's another thing to believe it. We need to not only read these words, but actually believe them. Actually believe that my God is causing me to triumph. Did anybody know that was in the Bible? Did you guys know that? I didn't just make that up. That's, that's right in there. But it only works if you believe it. And if you actually believe it, it produces this thing in you called faith. And when this thing in you is called faith, you can tell. It's not a mystery. Well, do I have faith or not? When you actually have faith, it produces a little bit of joy. It produces a little bubble in you. It produces a little bit of confidence and a little bit of hope. How many, how many know hope is a good thing? Hope and faith and confidence is a good thing. Friends, we have to be, oh, please, we just, can I get on my soapbox for two minutes? Give me two minutes on my soapbox. How many give me two minutes on my soapbox? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Okay. I got twelve minutes on my soapbox right there. You know, we all have voices in the world. Here's, here's the bottom line to my soapbox. Please be amazingly, amazingly careful who you listen to. The vast majority of the people in this world who talk the most, you need to listen to the least. If they talk a lot, the Proverbs actually says this. There's a verse in Proverbs that says this, in the abundance of words, there lacks not sin. Let me translate that for you. Somebody who talks a lot probably sins a lot. Just be careful. And, but, but here's my point. That we, we have voices, and, and I'm talking about now not just people around us, but voices in the media that we feel like, and here's what you need to be careful, because we feel like we have certain voices we can pick out, and, oh, that's the voice of light. Be careful. I don't, I, I just pay, I can't, I just can't pay attention to these voices. But just over the weekend, heard a couple of, was with somebody else, so they had a radio station on listening to, you know, one of these talking heads that was supposedly, supposedly, I guess according to the guy who was with it, supposedly was on our side. I don't know what our side was, but supposedly on our side. And this guy was just bashing the new president, Obama, and just, just well, I could, he wouldn't have called it bashing. But for, for several minutes, he had this montage of all, all these different reporters. And, and his, his whole point, you know, this guy that we were listening to, his whole point is that there's false hope. There, there are all these media heads, he said, they're, they're breeding false hope. And this, and this old change he's talking about, it's all false hope. And as I sat there and I listened to him, I'm like, who made you the crusher of all false hope? Who, who made you? You know, maybe some of it is false. Maybe some of it is a little bit big dreams that, that Obama's going to change everything. But who made you the crusher of all false hope? Let me tell you this, all right? Here's my soapbox. I'd rather be on the side of false hope than no hope any day of the week. Are you with me? Now, that may bug you, but there, I just bugged you, all right? And maybe some of it is false hope. For heaven's sakes, God did not ordain you to be the crusher of all false hope. And if false hope comes your way, I mean, hey, just smoke the pipe and pass along, all right? A little bit of false hope, whatever. <laughs> did I say that? I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm serious. Some of it, maybe some of it is false hope. But friends, a little bit of hope isn't going to hurt us. And, and so many of the talking heads that people listen to, they feel like it's their job. It's false hope, false hope, false hope. For heaven's sakes, just let's enjoy some hope. Enjoy some hope. You know what? It's not my job. It, it really isn't. It's not my job so much to fix everything that happens. And here's my, here's my really my point. Forgive me for saying smoke the pipe. All right? I didn't mean that. 
I got on my soapbox and got excited there. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like it's our righteous duty to, to straighten everything out and to fix everything and to talk about everything. And in, inevitably, what you end up doing is start paying attention to every wave and talking about every wave and talking about everything that's happening in this world. And I don't care what side you are on of that wave. If you're paying attention, talking about every wave, I don't care what side you're on. It's only a matter of time till fear will wrap its fingers around your throat and crush you. Absolutely crush you. There's only one way out of that. And that's not in that, here's the bottom line, that's not my job. God never commissioned me to be the straightener of all the waves in the world. To, to be the clarifier of what is real and what is false. That's not my job. My job is right here. I'm going to pay attention to what he has to say, all right? Uh, he says in verse 20, my son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Don't Look at what he says in verse 21. Pay attention to my words in verse 20. Don't let them out of your sight. In other words, it's supposed to be more than just a daily Bible you read for a few minutes in the morning. It's supposed to go with you. The confidence, the faith that comes from the fact that God is sustaining me, the promises that he says here are supposed to go in our hearts, lodge in our minds, and stay with us. I, I listened to a, a gentleman this weekend. He was an innkeeper, and I guess it's his job. I think he also you know, probably tends bar there as well, and he does a lot of things. So it's probably his job to listen to a lot of people. And I, and I was sitting there listening to him talking to somebody else, and as he was talking to them, he's, he just talks about how person after person who comes in, all they want to talk about is the hard times and how bad it is. And he says, my head is just going to explode from depression, he said. And I just listened, and I thought, wow, just from listening. And you know what, friends? That is what's going to happen to you if you just listen to every person who wants to talk about what happens in the world. And if, you'll back, if we back up a verse here, remember what Jesus did? ignoring what they said. Now, I'm not suggesting that you're supposed to go around every day, you know, to work, just ignoring everybody. But how many knows that your brain has already has this ability to be there and to kind of let things just, whoo, just, whoo. I have that. I, I'm really good at that. Just, <laughs> just smiling. And some of you, some of you figured this out. You know, the, just because the lights are on doesn't mean anybody's home there. Hello. <laughs> just let it go. Just let it go. Because you cannot, once you, be, once you enter that realm of being the, the, you know, the commentator and get, getting involved, and I'd say there are many conversations I have, and if they're going to go down that road, I feel like it's my job to help. And, and it is amazing, if you have the right heart and the right faith about you, how you can turn a conversation. You can take a conversation that starts down a woe is me road and how everything's falling apart and how you know, the, the world is coming to an end and turn it. And breathe a little bit of life. How many found you can breathe a little bit of life, a little bit of faith into conversations and breathe a little bit of faith into the people around you? And pretty soon they're going to want to be around you. They're like, wow, there's, maybe there is some hope. All right, let's be breeders of hope. All right, praise God. And I know Raquel has another illustration that will Not quite help. as good as yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to hear the end of that one. I know it. If you're visiting today, this, that's not normal. All right, we don't. We don't talk about that very often. <laughs> All right. Well, um, speaking of listening to voices, there was a time in my life um, when it wasn't necessarily other people's voices I was hearing, but um, just within my own self, you know, I had pretty much the devil sitting on my shoulder for quite a while, you know, telling me thoughts. And, you, you know, you need to quiet our own thoughts as well and not be listening to not just our own thoughts, but, you know, the devil wants to feed you. He loves this, the fear message and doubt message and everything's going to fall apart message. But if you're not careful, that's going to get within you and, and you're going to be replaying those tapes in your own head. And in my life, that was what was happening. I was, you know, I was hearing what the devil was saying to me that, you know, I had this thought on a regular basis, daily basis. It was a battle within me that he, he was going to kill me. I was going to die. And this, this went on for quite some time in my life. And uh, for, I would say, a couple years, this, I fought this battle of just the devil just telling me, you're going to die, you're going to die, and I, you know, get things prepared in your home, get, settle everything, get everything cleaned up and get it in order. I mean, I just had just, just all kinds of thought processes that were going through my head. And as this went on, I was battling this. I mean, I knew what the Word said. I knew what I needed to do. I was reading the Word every day, and I was focusing on the Word. And this, the Word is our answer. This was my answer. I had no other answers outside 
you know, there was no one else that could help me with this but God and his word. And as I was um, begin reading the word, I was reading it daily and just feeding on it daily. I knew that's what I needed to do in my heart. And as I was reading the word, I came to um, Psalms one day. It, I had read this verse probably a hundred times. I've prayed it, said it, Psalms 91, many of you know it, and I just came to the part where it said, at the end of the psalm, it said, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. Now, I had read this over and over. I had been praying about this. I had been meditating on the word, but at this moment, just all of a sudden, it was like God himself said this word to me. I'm not saying I heard an audible voice, but just in my heart, I just, all of a sudden, it was like God said, with long life, I will satisfy you. And that was my answer to all the battling within my own heart that I had been going through for this time. That was it. God said, with long life, I will satisfy you. Now, I'd like to say I never had a, a negative thought again, and it never hit me again. But, you know, that was my answer. And I just, I, all of a sudden, and it was through reading the word. Had I not been reading the word, I would not have come to this scripture and got this point. But God, it was just like he just said it to my heart with long life. And that was his promise to me at that moment. I wasn't going to die young. This was probably, I don't know, 10 years ago this went on. I wasn't going to die young, that God promised me long life. And just as I read that, it just just gave me a faith and a lightheartedness. But then as, but then, you know, the thought would come again, you know, the devil just doesn't quit. You know, he's going to keep trying. If he thinks he's going to get a foot in the door, he's going to keep trying. And so every time that thought would came, I would just come back in my own heart with that scripture. With long life, he'll satisfy you and show you that you're his salvation. So every time I had that thought for, from that point on to even to this day, if I ever have that thought again, which, you know, I don't battle it, you know, as I did at that time just the constant fear. I had. I don't have that fear. But for a short time, the devil was really working me, trying to get me to live in fear and doubt. And But that scripture, the word of God, is what brought life. And every time I would, you know, another thought would come, I would just say that scripture. No, God promised with long life he will satisfy me and show me his salvation. So the, the words we need to be listening to, the thoughts that we need to be meditating on, is not the thoughts of the world or other people, but we need to get this scripture in our own heart so that when these other thoughts from outside or from even within our own selves come, we have the word of God to combat it with. I don't know. I, I, you just listened to your story. I just want to make sure that you comprehend, because this is something that, if not all of us, many of us will deal with, is some, you know, probably the majority of fears have a natural reason behind them, and maybe they're a little bit easier to understand. I mean, a wave, Peter's situation, that's, that's relatively simple to understand. But a lot of times, there's fears that are just irrational. Uh, Raquel's situation, they really had no connection. There was no physical symptoms. And please don't misunderstand. We're not suggesting, okay, ignore any symptom and don't ever go to the doctor. I mean, of course, we're not talking anything ridiculous like that. But there, were, there was nothing. There were no symptoms. Now, after she went on, on a while with these fears, I mean, there would be some, you know, things that popped up. But I think it's important that you, that you understand just the, the level and the depth to which these fears uh, really wrapped her. This went on for weeks and months. Is that correct? More than a year. More than a year. And, I mean, again, just describe the fear, just so I, I just want to make sure people get it, that this wasn't just, just a casual thought. the fear was thought. so great that I literally had, had visions. I had pictures of me falling down dead or, or my kids coming home and finding me. I mean, just pictures, whole movies in my head of everything that would happen and would, was going to happen or could happen or, you know, this, this was your last night. This is your last night. You better, you know, spend extra time with your kids. You know, just... I mean, not, this was a whole storyline. This wasn't just little thoughts. Right. And just to understand this, fear and faith uh, work exactly the same, only opposites. Fear will actually produce pictures, and, and faith will as well. Faith will produce pictures. Uh, Raquel said a video, even a video. You'll just kind of see God lifting you. You'll see yourself triumphing. You'll see, and again, it's, we're not talking about any of the positive thinking. That's not the point. But the point is, is when you truly do believe that God's word, that he is causing you to triumph, that will produce a positive picture, all right? Just because the world and some, you know, uh, new agers got a hold of some positive thinking, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, the heart of that is in the word of God, that when you truly believe God's word, you truly believe, and, and that's really what came to her. That scripture came to her, and that's what you're looking for every day as you read the Daily Bible. I hope, again, you're not reading it just like a newspaper to check it off. But you're actually asking the Holy Spirit to bring something off of that page. The Holy Spirit reveals something to you. 
And that's what happened. The Holy Spirit brought something off that page. You know, she probably read that scripture. I bet you anything. In fact, you could have, you knew that scripture was in the Bible even during that whole year. If somebody would have said, you know, there's a scripture in the Bible that says with long life I'll satisfy you. You'd heard that scripture before. So again, it's not enough to know a Bible verse. You know, she knew that mentally, but it wasn't real to her. And until it's real, there's, there's no faith there. And she read it that day, and it just jumped off the page. This is God talking to me. This is what God, this is God's word, and it's all God's word, but it's, it's personal now. This is God talking to me. And some of these fears can be irrational, but I tell you what, once, you, once those fears are reality in your world, they will keep you caged in and, and eventually even come to pass. It was Job who said in the Bible that what I've so greatly feared has come upon me. Listen to a little illustration. I just think it fits in our world. The African impala, in case you're not familiar, that's a, basically a, a little deer. <laughs> All right. The African impala can jump to a height of well over 10 feet and cover a distance of greater than 30 feet. Yet these magnificent creatures are kept in enclosures in zoos around the world with a small three-foot wall. The animals will not jump if they cannot see where their feet will fall. In other words, just with this small little thing, I guess that just it causes them where they can't see because they're kind of short. They can't see uh, over that, can't see what's on the other side of it, so they'll just stay right there. Though they could clear that thing without any challenge, they'll stay right there because they can't see out in front of them. Faith is the ability to trust what we cannot see with our physical eyes. We have to be able to see, and we're, we're really that way. That's what fear does, that we have... You know, God has enabled us just as his, you know, as his sons and daughters with amazing abilities, amazing abilities to, uh, to walk and to accomplish amazing things. But I think probably the majority of, of humanity will be shocked when they find out how little of a wall that caged them in, how small of a fear actually kept them caged in when they could have lived a life of joy. And that's exactly the truth, that as you really have... Just, just simple faith, just a simple knowledge that God's word is true. God's going to sustain us. Let me give you one more illustration, and we'll close with this. When a traveler in the early days of the West came to the Mississippi, he discovered there was no bridge. Fortunately, it was winter, and the Great River was sheeted over with ice. But the traveler was very afraid to trust himself to this ice, not knowing how thick it was. Finally, with infinite caution, he crept on his hands and knees, inching forward, waiting, listening for any cracking sound. He managed to get halfway over. It took him hours. When he heard, when he heard, yes, he heard singing from behind him. Cautiously, he turned around, and out of the dusk came another traveler driving a four-horse load of coal over the ice, singing as he went. <laughs> now, can you imagine that picture? He's just, just creeping along the ice, just just waiting to hear a noise. And I'm sure, you know, if you've ever been on the ice, there's always some noise. I'm sure he heard noise. No, oh, I'm going down. And he hears singing. And here's this guy you know, with four horses, a big load of coal, just driving across the ice, singing sunny day. That's my favorite song. Everything's a-okay. Did they have that song back then? Friendly neighbors. Yes, that's where we meet. You guys know the, you know the song? Okay. I was waiting for you to join me. You didn't help me out there a bit. What's the point? I mean, why, why do you suppose this other guy, uh, you know, was so happy and so joyful driving across with, you know, probably over 1,000 pounds? Why? Because he had faith. He knew. He'd been there. He'd lived here. He'd probably been back over that thing for years, he, you know, during this time. And he'd seen people. And he knew this was safe. He, had, he knew what was underneath him is the bottom line. Uh, let me ask you a simple question. What, what do you have beneath you? What's holding you up? Is God holding you up? Is his word holding you up? Well, if it is, then you're going to go along your way singing. And you're going to look around, and there's probably a lot of other people just inching along, just waiting to hear some little crack. When I hope you have a little bit of faith with me that how many believe God can uphold us? Amen? Praise God. Let's stand up together. You know, there's obviously a lot of things we shared with you. I'm hoping, I'm hoping if there's one scripture that would stick in your head, it was what there with Jesus concerning Jairus, that the Bible says Jesus ignoring what they said. And again, there's just a lot, and in the majority of the reports of this world, you just need to ignore. And, and let's pay attention to what God has to say. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? 
I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to Christ today. You, you're here today. You may be here, and you're a good person. You may love God, but you've never fully surrendered your heart to Christ. Friends, that, the, the only life of joy, the only life of faith is a life knowing that you are completely in the hands of God. And that is your will. That's your choice. God is not going to make that choice for you. Throughout the scripture, one thing God makes clear is he calls all men everywhere, all people, to repent, to turn away from their own path, to turn away from you know, just guiding their own life down sinful roads, to just humbly turning to him, saying, God, you made me, you know me, and I want to serve you, I want to follow you, I want to submit my life to you and to your word. Nobody can make that choice for you. But I tell you, friends, the, what you may so greatly fear is actually the best, most joy-filled, peaceful life in the world, life in the world, knowing that God is upholding you, God is sustaining you, because you fully submitted your life to him. A lot of people say that, well, I trust God. But you can't really trust him until you've fully submitted your life to him. Only there can you fully trust him. Friends, nobody's looking around. We're going to end in just a minute. But if you're here today and you've yet to fully surrender your life to Christ, and, and today, we're not going to embarrass you, but today, you'd like to say yes to him. You just simply want to pray a simple prayer. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you. But would you, right now, would you just lift your hand up right there where you're standing and say, Pastor Brian, you're talking to me, and I want to surrender my life to Christ. I want to say yes to Christ. I want to open my heart open my life to Jesus Christ. I want to open my heart to God and say yes to him and yes to his word. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Say yes to God. Say, God, I want to serve you with my whole heart. I want to turn away from the ways of the world. There's another hand. Anybody else? Praise God. Thank you for those hands. Let's do this. If I could have my life group leaders come down front we're going to end this service but as they're coming down I want to lead us all in a prayer and let's just all pray with these who've lifted their hands saying they want to surrender their life to Christ just say this right out loud say Lord Jesus Lord I believe in you Lord I believe that you lived a sinless life and you were crucified for me and you were, you were raised from the dead and you're alive right now and Lord, right now, I submit to you. I open my heart. And I say, Lord, I want to serve you all the days of my life. Fill me with your spirit. Strengthen me to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're one of those who just lifted your hand as we're dismissed, I'm going to ask you to come down and let us pray for you. If you may not... You, you weren't one of those, but you just need some prayer in your life. There's something that you need some help with. God wants to help you. If that's you, as we're dismissed, I'm going to pray one more time, and we'll be dismissed. And as we're dismissed, please come down and let us pray with you. Father God, thank you that we can walk in faith, knowing that you will sustain us. Your word will uphold us. In Jesus' name.